Six years on from the EU referendum, the UK is confronting a grim truth. Brexit is not done. The deal that Boris Johnson described as oven ready has led to a potential trade war with the EU, while the economic consequences of Brexit are becoming clearer by the day. The OECD recently forecasts that the UK would grow slower next year than every major country except Russia. In this week's New Statesman cover story, Ivan Rogers, the former UK ambassador to the EU, explains why even the Brexiteers are in despair over Brexit. And I'm pleased to say we're joined by Ivan today. Ivan, as you write in your piece, it's striking how many Leave politicians complain that Brexit isn't living up to its potential, or even that this is a Remainers Brexit. Why are they so unhappy? Well, thanks, George, and thanks for inviting me today. Um, Well, they're not getting the version of Brexit uh, that they wanted. And yet, curiously, of course, in terms of the the depth of Brexit and the distance from the European Union, they are, because they got a hard Brexit as opposed to a soft Brexit, which was what Theresa May's rather sort of garbled version of Brexit was. Boris Johnson did, did deliver getting us out of both single market and customs union and deliberately went for a very thin trade deal, uh, which left us maximum autonomy, but got us very little on services and and not a a great deal on goods either. And yet they're deeply unhappy. And the unhappiness really is that, as we're hearing now from David Frost and many others on the right of the party and the European Research Group, right, this was always for them, I think, a means to an end. Brexit was not an end in itself. It was a vehicle for the delivery of a kind of low, uh, low tax, small state nirvana. And there they think Johnson is betraying them because he's a high tax, high spend, um, uh, profligate prime minister. And while we had COVID running, I think he could get away with that um, because it was obvious that you needed uh, very, very substantial assistance, both to small businesses and to people just to see them through. But now we're through COVID and we're beyond lockdown and we're back in, uh, you know, what was before the war, a, um, a normal economy. I think they're deeply disappointed with the direction of travel from their own prime minister because he's not delivering the kind of low tax, small state, um, ultra Thatcherite vision that they thought was integral to their version of Brexit. Do you think they were naive to believe that the... Thatcherite 2.0 agenda they wanted uh, would be delivered? Well, possibly, yes, because um, Johnson's brilliance as a retail politician um, was, after all, delivering a coalition and a totally different coalition from the one that you know Cameron and Osborne had delivered and a bigger coalition, which got him a thumping majority at the 2019 election. But that was of both uh, Blue Wall and Red Wall. And it's not obvious that a kind of Thatcherite, uh, ultra liberal, small state Brexit, um, you know, has massive appeal in some of those areas where he brought the Tory success where they hadn't had it in the previous half century, if not longer. So I think there was a degree of naivety. And I think what we're seeing now, and we're starting to see it emerge in British politics, is the difficulty of keeping that coalition together. We saw the extent of the opposition to him right across the party in the no confidence vote. So lots of different wings of the party deeply unhappy with Johnson, um, partly over personal behaviour, but partly over what he's failing to deliver in government. But of course, he's he's straddling a very uneasy coalition of people who want fundamentally different things out of a post-Brexit Britain. And as you say in your piece, the economic damage from Brexit is becoming increasingly evident. What do you think have been the biggest costs? Well, I think a lot of it was very predictable. I mean, when you leave the single market and customs union, um, and I always thought we would, incidentally, and always said so at the time I was working in government after the referendum, and indeed before the referendum, uh, talking to politicians about what would happen if we left. So none of this is a surprise to me. I thought we would go rather far out and would have to for free movement reasons, rule taking reasons, and we would want sovereignty on trade policy. But if you do so, by definition, you're re-erecting trade barriers with what used to be your home market. Um, and those trade barriers uh, lead to supply chain disruptions and stickiness and extra cost for businesses on goods. 
Um, and probably even worse for services, where, of course, we're an ultra competitive economy, but services liberalization across borders in the kind of jargon is, is very difficult. Uh, however incomplete the single market was, we got much further with it with European partners than with anybody else in the world. And we've therefore re-erected against our own trade in both goods and services a whole bunch of barriers that we spent the previous 30 to 40 years demolishing. It's not surprising that you're starting to see that impact on trade volumes and trade intensity. It's not surprising that also has a big effect on dampening business investment, which has been very weak really since uh, the 2016 referendum. And those are the main channels by which you're seeing the economic damage. I think there are other channels as well, but those are the main channels. It's um, a loss of competitiveness in the European market and a loss of market share. It's reduction in trade volumes, trade intensity. Uh, It's weakening our services export performance. And it's damaging uh, business investment because there's still huge uncertainty about the regulatory environment that this government is offering. And and that they appear to be perpetuating via what Jacob Rees-Mogg and others are saying. One problem for Leave politicians, as you write, is that it's hard to point to many direct benefits from Brexit. Is that because Boris Johnson's government is incompetent or is that because the potential benefits were always small? Well, it's quite a difficult question and it's difficult um, in timing terms as well. Um, There are two sorts of benefits, I suppose, that the Brexiteers uh, sought. First of all, was a sort of diversification benefit, if I can put it like that. In other words, we don't have all our eggs or too many of our eggs in the European basket. And it's a slow growing, sclerotic behemoth of an economy. And we want to be linked in with faster growing economies in the world. And we're going to do you know, liberal free trading deals with them. Well, up to a point, Lord Copper. Um, we'll see how many of those actually get delivered. The difficulty with trade deals, even with distant Uh, fast growing uh, countries is how much liberalisation, particularly on services, as I say, do you get and how much of a dividend does it deliver? Even the most optimistic people in and around government never said that there were huge benefits from a transatlantic trade deal or from the CPTPP or from a Chinese deal, which is obviously now dead, or an Indian deal on which they're trying. All of these benefits are rather small in terms of the overall macro economy. So that was one sort of benefit. The other sort of benefit is essentially kind of deregulation. You get out, you can regulate your own economy in your own interest better. You can free up areas of the economy and regulate them differently from the way you had to when you were one of 28. Uh, And some of the Brexiteers thought there were uh, and think there are substantial dividends from that. I'd have to say, though, even on that, you know, when you go back to uh, the work that, say, Open Europe did, and they were the chief uh, Brexit supporting lobby and the chief think tank before the referendum, during the referendum, even they at their most optimistic were not putting very large numbers, you know, a maximum of about a percent of GDP on substantial deregulation and re-regulation and regulating better than we were able to do in the European Union. So the problem is the numbers don't add up because the costs of Brexit, at least in the kind of short, medium term, over the five to 10 year perspective, are quite substantial in terms of loss of trade, trade volumes, business investment. And you're seeing that all of that is pretty much as predicted. And you're seeing uniformity amongst the Bank of England, the Treasury, the Office of Budget Responsibility, but also a vast proportion of private sector economists. All of that's fairly obvious because if you deintegrate, one of the things I'm trying to say in my piece is this is a process of deintegration. You're deliberately deintegrating from people to whom you were very close and with whom you were very close partners. You wanted the liberatory sort of sovereignty benefits of that to, you know, to go your own way. But deintegration inevitably does have costs. None of that's a, a tremendous surprise. The, the, the ability to offset those deintegration costs with massive benefits, either from trade deals or from regulating yourselves better, is genuinely difficult. I'm not saying none of it can be done. Do I think that, you know, in financial services or gene, t- gene uh, editing or, you know, multiple other things, the UK could on its own plough a slightly different furrow Um, and do it more effectively and do it faster and with greater nimbleness and that that might have a dividend in terms of ultimately attracting business. Now, I think some of that is true. I just don't think that the overall gains add up to anything like the overall losses, I'm afraid. 
Are there any indirect benefits they can point to? Some say the vaccine programme, for instance. They say, yes, it's true that um, the UK uh, was technically still following the uh, the EU rules at the time, but maybe it would have been less likely to to go its own way on 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 vaccine procurement and so on if it had still be a, been a full member of the EU. Uh, I think that's an interesting case, and I'm not sure I'm in a great position to judge, having not been in the system at the time. Uh, they were, certainly would have come under pressure uh, had they remained in the European Union to go with the European Union uh, kind of programme and methodology, because look what happened to the other major member states. I mean, if everybody had behaved like the British inside the European Union, then the big member states, above all the French and the Germans, but the, you know, the other big players would have done their own thing sorted their own uh, manufacturing, sorted their own needs and said, we don't much care about Slovakia and Estonia and Bulgaria. So there is a there is a question of whether you could pursue, obviously legally you could have pursued the British course remaining in the European Union. Would we have been under pressure not to? And would that then have had costs for the UK? That's a, that's a genuinely interesting question. So obviously by definition, if you leave, you are likely to take different courses. You're likely to pursue uh, pursue that autonomously. I would say on vaccines, you look at the EU compared with the US, the EU's performance on the whole on vaccine production and delivery, although it made a rather slow and hesitant start, has been substantially better than the US's. But big blocks obviously have to take their slowest members with them, and they also have to guarantee something to their slowest members who otherwise wouldn't be able to equip themselves and wouldn't have the, the marketing power in a vaccines market to be able to procure anything at all. So that's that, that's both a benefit and a cost of being in the European Union, I suppose. Mm. You obviously served as the UK's permanent representative to the EU from 2013 until your resignation uh, under Theresa May in 2017. What are the main lessons you learned about the EU as an institution during that time? And is the reality different to the perception? Well, I think the reality is different to the perception that you get in most of, if not nearly all the UK media, yes, um, which is not to say, you know, I'm in love with the institutions or uh, the ways in which it operates or that I think there are no problems of democratic deficits or democratic accountability or the way in which legislation is produced, you know, having experienced that on the inside. So there's a whole load I could say about the real way in which the EU operates. I think what's striking about the exit process is often the naivety of the UK system, not just at the political level, but at the bureaucratic level about what they were dealing with. The EU is a a difficult beast to negotiate with, both on trade and economic and regulatory issues, where it is, after all, one of the biggest beasts in the world. It's a regulatory superpower, a microeconomic superpower, a trade superpower. But in no sense, of course, is it a superpower with hard power in the foreign policy and geostrategic world. It's it's aspiring to become more of that. You're seeing that it, it, even during this war. But at the time I was there, um, it was struggling as a, a major foreign policy player. And it had some important roles, for example, on the kind of Iran sanctions issue and one or two other very big picture issues. But you wouldn't say it was a coherent, strong geostrategic actor. And indeed, at the time of the Crimean sanctions, which I was there uh, negotiating sanctions packages um, or on the Russians in 2014, it was very difficult to get unity and coherence. Does that come? Is that coming more now um, than it was when we were in the European Union? Big, big and open question. I mean, obviously, the performance, I would say, during this war has been more coherent and hugely difficult for the European Union because of energy security and now food security, because of the inflation impact, because of the differential impact for Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans. I mean, it's enormously complex, but I would say they've been more coherent and performed more effectively than they did several years ago. But nobody nobody would say that the European Union was, um, you know, a top level geopolitical strategic actor you know can it get there over the coming decades and what does that mean in terms of foreign policy and defense who knows but it would take a long time to do so from here and it's still on those kinds of issues revolves around its big member states perhaps the most obvious change uh, post brexit has been the end of free movements do you think the uk is learning that you can reduce immigration but that it comes at a cost 
Well, I think it's probably not as simple as that. I think we're not necessarily reducing immigration. We are changing the composition of immigration. So we always had control over immigration from outside the European Union. That was true before the referendum. We had this extraordinary target under David Cameron uh, government, which covered both free movement from within the European Union and external migration from outside the European Union. And candidly, none of my 27 colleagues nor the institutions ever understood how you could have a target covering one thing you controlled and the other thing that you couldn't control. So that was a big complexity in my life at the time of the renegotiation. What we've done is quite interesting, it seems to me. Um, The UK's policy on free movement is obviously to end it. That was a very, very strong belief uh, from Theresa May. But I don't see either the current government or a Labour government going back to full free movement to people. So it's much more difficult for Europeans to move here and, of course, for UK citizens uh, to move in and around the European Union. That's changed fundamentally and in an illiberal direction, and that's reducing numbers very sharply. Numbers of people coming from outside the European Union have been going up. And we've got a relatively liberal immigration policy. Now, that's partly, I think, Boris Johnson is more liberal on immigration policy and more relaxed. Maybe um, the positive on this is that this is less of a salient issue than it was in 2015-16. And the British public are more relaxed about having very sizable numbers coming in if they think the government nevertheless has a policy and has control over the borders. I'm not I'm not totally sure that's right. I just think the salience has dropped because the salience of other things has increased radically over the last five years. So I remain to be convinced. But if you look at the evidence, actually, immigrate overall immigration numbers, I think, are not falling. We may well find that an effect of Brexit is to increase overall immigration from outside the European Union at the cost of migration from within the European Union. One hope among Brexiteers was that the UK's departure would set off a chain reaction of others. People talked about Frexit, for instance. Um, Why do you think that hasn't proved to be the case? Well, if you talk to my old European counterparts, and I still do talk to some, of course, they would say one of the reasons it hasn't been the case is uh, you've made such a fiasco of the Brexit process. And anybody looking at British performance in this process both on the Northern Ireland Protocol and on the Trade Cooperation Agreement and the mess of your politics now is put off by it. And therefore, even the populists who were very tempted from you know Le Pen to Salvini to go down similar routes and to talk about a potential exit either from the Eurozone or the European Union have all gone cold on the idea because how on earth could you market it to your citizens, given uh, how people look at the British experience. So I think the European Union has got much more relaxed about the possibility of anybody going down that route. When I was there immediately after the referendum, there was no question that people thought this could be an existential crisis for the Union, that we could be the first of many, that others would follow the path. And of course, that then played into the position they took on the Article 50 negotiations, believing that if they didn't cement their position and their solidarity dealing with the the UK, it might be the beginning of a major unravelling. I think people are much more relaxed about that now because they don't think it is. Um, They think the UK is still playing games in terms of trying to divide and rule, still using um, pressure on Dublin to see whether it can, uh, you know, exacerbate uh, pressures for scepticism in Dublin politics, still playing that game in Poland, in Hungary, in bits of Eastern Europe. But I think they're quite relaxed about whether any of that will work. Why did it not work? Because I do think, and I think we are different. I mean, um, the w- one area where, you know, I think there's more common ground between my perspective and kind of classic Brexiteer, Euro, Eurosceptic perspectives is, look, I'm not arguing that kind of we're unique and exceptional and, uh, and, and completely different in every respect. But there is a specificity and a difference to the British debate and a difference in our conception of what the European Union was for and where we ever wanted to be in it than there is in most other players. And was also a size difference. Let's be honest, you know, can a Denmark or a Sweden, given their level of integration with continental European and above all German economies, could they do what we have done? You could think we're messing it up. I do think we're making a terrible hash of Brexit and it could have been done much more smoothly and it could have been done with less damage Uh, to ourselves. Uh, So I think it's a mess. But we can nevertheless still do it. 
we're big and bold and bad enough to go it alone. It's perfectly viable proposition to go it alone. You'd have to question with small, maybe even medium-sized economies, even in Northern Europe, whether even if they wanted to do it, they'd got the kind of institutional power to pull it off and whether they would effectively, even if they did take themselves out of the European Union, end up as rule takers with much less sovereignty as a consequence of exiting than more sovereignty. So I do think we're in a slightly different position from, as I say, a Denmark or a Sweden or a relatively modest Central and Eastern European player who might consider the same path. I, I think Britain is is different in that respect. We are big enough to be able to do this, whether or not you think it's a wise thing to do it. There were some who said that though the EU always expressed sorrow about Brexit in public, in private, the EU uh, drew some pleasure from it because they they believed it would demonstrate the costs of leaving the EU to other member states, and also that it would give the EU a chance to pursue deeper integration without being held back by the UK. Do you think that's true? It's true in some quarters and not in others. I think there is regret in some quarters and more Anglophile quarters who've gone a bit quiet, obviously, recently and who are are rather distressed about dealings with the UK government. But nonetheless, there's still a lot of people who regret British exit and thought that we were essential to the composition of the union and thought we were a counterbalance to French and German uh, axis and we were liberalising and free trading and pro-competition and we brought a global perspective which perhaps is lacking at least in some uh, other places so I think there's still more regret there are some who think yes we're now freer to get on with things and if you look at the kind of budgetary package the next generation EU budgetary package which was huge uh, massive spending at European level but also massive borrowing by the European Commission nearly everybody I know inside the other 27 would say well we'd never have been able to do that at least in that fashion had the British been there because they'd have vetoed it The same applies on some of the kind of defence developments. We'll see how far they're able to go. What does that mean? What does it mean in terms of capability, in terms of procurement? But certainly the British were the main blockage on progress um, on a kind of European defence because we were always obsessed with whether it in some way contradicted what we were trying to do inside NATO or undercut it. So I think there are things. Look, I, one of the things, one of the reasons why I don't believe that Britain will rejoin is I do think the EU will go further, will enter new domains of kind of integration, is already doing so, and that makes it even less comfortable for British politicians, even pro-European British politicians, ever to make the case to go back in. And incidentally, I think one of the things I find most mystifying about a lot of the Eurosceptic um, commentary on this is as if these people are sort of pining away and desperate for a sort of a resumed negotiation and a British reaccession process so that we come back with our tail between our legs and, and have to negotiate a different version of membership. I don't detect any of that at all. I mean, most people think that we're gone. We're gone for good. We're gone for good or ill. You know, they may regret it, but they don't think we're coming back and they think the union's got to get on uh, you know, you're seeing what they're doing today vis-a-vis Ukraine and Moldova. They're looking at Western Balkans accession. They are assuredly not looking at UK accession again. I mean, they think that we've gone, we've gone in a completely different direction. And, you know, the, the job for them is to deepen the union in the areas it needs deepening, get more coherent, but also then bring in new members in the Balkans and ranging into Ukraine and Moldova. The British issue in terms of, you know, do the Brits ever rejoin and what does that look like is as dead as a dodo. Nobody's interested in it. Obviously, the SNP in Scotland is pushing for um, a second independence referendum and is also uh, very anti-Brexit and committed, would be committed to trying to secure EU membership for an independent Scotland. How do you think the EU would respond to an independent Scotland? Well, it's a, diff- it's a really difficult question, that, because um, what's different about the Scots from the Western Balkans or the Ukrainians or the Moldovans, and obviously there's huge sympathy for both Ukrainians and Moldovans and plenty for the Balkans, but the Scots have, by dint of UK membership, been members before. So in principle, it's very difficult, if they were an independent Scotland and it came with an application for membership, it's very difficult to tell them, you know, wait your place in the queue 
uh, and uh, and it'll take a very very long time because the, you're dealing with a set of citizens who've been citizens of the EU before, and and a government that would be expressing a desire to sort of have a closer link with the EU than with the UK and be in a single market with you and not in a single market with the UK, and just saying well you know piss off uh, we're not interested in that and wait wait to the end of the queue and it, it might happen in twenty years is problematic because emotionally people will want to be supportive. But they'll be extremely uh, bothered. I mean, one, this issue won't arise at all until there is an independent Scotland. There, there, there would be a major desire in Brussels and in capitals to know what the settlement had been between an independent Scot- Scotland and the rest of the UK. So they would want that negotiation essentially to have happened and for the upshot of it to be clear. And then there are very difficult questions because obviously Scotland, you know, has more of an economic relationship with the rest of the UK than with the rest of the EU. So there would be a border across uh, our island. How does that work? Uh, That's an external border with a, you know, quite troublesome and problematic partner in what would be the rest of the UK, England and Wales. Uh, But with with a Scotland wanting to be in the single, where, where where are the Scots on the currency question? you know, seeming to want to have their cake and eat it at this stage, you know, wanting to remain in a sterling block, but where, you know, ultimately they would presumably have to have a vocation to join the euro. Where are the Scots going to be on the Schengen question? So I think there'll be a lot of, uh, but also the emotional attachment and enthusiasm, but a lot of bureaucratic and administrative reticence and, and a desire to have a lot of clarity between the rest of the UK and a departing Scotland and to know what that settlement looked like before you knew what you were trying to negotiate with the Scots if they re- wanted to accede. The other point people normally make is, is would the EU be wary of granting Scotland membership for fear of encouraging secessionist forces in other European countries, perhaps most obviously um, the Basque separatists in Spain? Yes, Basque country, Catalonia, obviously Belgium itself, given the huge divisions between Wallonia and Flanders, uh, there's always that issue there. And obviously Spain in particular, very preoccupied by it. I think you would be able to differentiate the cases if there had been a legitimate vote, legitimately recognised, and a negotiation between the rest of the UK and a departing Scotland, because that wouldn't be the position patently in Spain and Catalonia. So what it would ha- what what there would have to be is a case which Brussels, Madrid, and other capitals recognised was identifiably differentiable from a Catalonia case or a Basque country case or a Belgian case, and I think that's doable. But of course, it's on everybody's mind. Yes, and what does this mean? Is it a fragmentation? Do we want more and more micro states joining? What does that look like? As I say, in the end, if there had been a legitimate vote and the Scots Nats had won it and they said they didn't want EFTA EEA membership, they wanted full EU membership, I think it's very difficult to say we're not even opening accession talks with you. But there are very difficult questions in those accession talks. OK, an awful lot of the statute book could rapidly be brought back to exactly equivalent to the European Union statute book and no doubt the Scots Nats would, uh, would commit to that. But those questions of what does the single market look like? What does the sing, you know? What's the commitment on the currency? What's your currency regime look like? What are you doing on Schengen? Where are you on some of the kind of big justice and home affairs things where the UK previously had opt outs? There's some quite big questions in there for any Scottish national government. One of the main reasons that the UK joined the European Economic Community back in. 1973 uh, was that it was seen as a uh, sick man of Europe and as suffering relative to its competitors. Do you think the same logic will apply in the future? In other words, will, if the EU outgrows the UK, will economic logic force it to come to a more constructive relationship? Well, that's a pretty long term question. I mean, that's right as a matter of history. Why did we go in and why were the Conservatives, after all, including Margaret Thatcher at the time, enthusiastic about going in? Because the continental European powers had had the Trente Glorieuse and a hugely successful post-war period. And we thought of ourselves in an Efton block as having a rather unsuccessful period. And so you saw an acceleration of the old EEC6 
outperforming us in the kind of EFTA block of seven. We're obviously in a totally different world now because it's a much more globalised world. So you weren't then in a world where China was present at all and where, you know, you'd seen the growth in Southeastern Asia, you'd seen the growth in Latin America. So it's obviously a, a radically different world from the one we were all inhabiting in the early 70s. I do think the EU membership at the time, or EEC membership, leading ultimately to single market integration, um, probably helped modernise the UK economy. I know the story inside the Conservative Party is all that this was kind of structural reform, supply side reform driven by the indomitable Margaret Thatcher. And obviously, there's a very large element of truth in that, of the kind of modernisation of the economy and her preparedness to take very difficult, bold decisions and change the kind of fabric of the society and um, and drive economic reform. But our perform our relative performance, our relative performance relative to France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, did improve after we acceded, and probably has improved most actually in the period after 1992 and the completion of the single market. That's one of the ironies of exit. If you look at our performance vis-a-vis the Eurozone majors, I would probably argue that over the last 25 years, we've mostly outperformed the Eurozone majors because we have, you know, uh, benefited from single market integration, strong services sector, open and liberal labour market, stronger product market reforms. You know, on the whole, you know, gross generalisation, obviously, because we've had huge difficulties, particularly after the financial crisis about, about our model. But on the whole, we've done at least as well as French and Germans, if not better. We still have the huge productivity problem that we're seeing, you know, front and centre of the debate now. And still per capita productivity is way lower than France and Germany. But you could argue that bringing ourselves into the old EEC and the EU was part of modernising and reforming the economy. And that's, of course, what the Conservative case was in 1973. And then in the 1975 referendum, it was it viewed joining the old EEC, which, of course, was sold whether you think on false pretenses or or on the right grounds, it was sold as a free trade project. project. Um, It was not sold as an incipient political union. Finally, um, do you think the UK will ever rejoin the EU? Well, ever's a long time. I, I, I don't expect to see it in my lifetime. I do think we've chosen a different path. I think there were, you know, good and legitimate reasons for that, as well as uh, erroneous reasons or or reasons which I don't really buy in terms of what we're seeing now seem to me to be utterly predictable. Um, so I think there was always a, you know, a sovereignty and democratic case. And it doesn't surprise me, you know, I was sitting in Whitehall well before the referendum thinking that sooner or later, we might face a passing of the ways, uh, that we were never going to join the Eurozone, which was, you know, a key for the rest. We were never going to join Schengen. We had a pick and mix relationship to the ever burgeoning justice and home affairs. So, you know, insiders with whom I was working always viewed us as halfway in, halfway out anyway, and thought that we had in some ways, of course, a very comfortable package of the best of both worlds. And I always thought this is not sustainable necessarily in the medium and longer term because we're a sort of semi-detached member who wants some of the benefits of economic integration, single market and customs union, but we don't want fiscal integration, political integration, Schengen, monetary integration. We're not keen on defence integration. So by definition, I thought we were approaching at some stage a crisis point where there might be a passing of the ways. Do I think if the EU progresses and survives and the Eurozone uh, progresses and survives. Big if, incidentally. I mean, I, you know, the Eurozone has huge structural issues still to resolve. I think it's made a lot of progress in the last 10 years and put together a lot of emergency packages, which have gradually turned into institutional devices. But I still don't think it's a stable and coherent uh, monetary union. I still think they've got much more to do on banking union. They've got much more to do on the fiscal side. But the more they do that, And the more they move forward in other areas, ranging from kind of energy to defence, and the more they go for uh, fiscal borrowing, you know, fiscal activity and borrowing at the EU level, the more unlikely it seems to me that the UK under any putative UK government is likely to want to rejoin. 
So I think the honest answer is I don't expect it to happen in the in the next generation. I don't think it will be an issue. I think there are still on the Remain side of the UK debate, if that's still a legitimate expression, a lot of fantasies about what the EU is and where it is and whether we could ever rejoin. Obviously, you know, we're in a very febrile world, extraordinary events going on, a potential sort of collapse of globalisation 1.0 and a completely different world order emerging. There may well be more impetus to have a closer relationship both with the US and the EU because we all stand together or we fall together, and that may force us back to a different sort of economic relationship. I just don't think it forces us back to membership. Personally, I would like a closer relationship. I think there's a lot that we need to do with the Europeans. I think there's a lot of common ground about the state of the world and what we want the world to look like. And I I regret that at the moment the relationship is so bad and the distrust between the sides is so deep that a lot of that isn't happening. And personally, we haven't even talked about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, I think there's a huge impediment to getting to a more constructive relationship over the next two to five years. I don't expect it to happen very soon. In the medium term, do I think that there is going to be a different, deeper and hopefully more constructive relationship with the EU and the UK? Yes, but I think it might take until the back end of the 2020s to get there. And I think it'll be quite a bumpy period between now and then with both sides uh, you know, viewing each other with deep distrust. And I don't think that's just the current personalities. It's obviously exacerbated by uh, the personality of the Prime Minister and probably the Foreign Secretary now and maybe beyond that. But I don't think it's just that. There are structural issues here in the relationship which will have to be ironed out over quite a long period. There is a case, though, particularly if the Western world is facing a challenge from China and from the authoritarian autocratic world, there's a case on national security grounds, on resilience grounds, on supply chain grounds for a closer relationship where we actually behave as friends to each other rather than in the way we're behaving now. Thanks very much, Ivan. Lots of fascinating insights there. And you can read Ivan's cover story for this week's New Statesman on why even the Brexiteers are in despair over Brexit by subscribing today.